Hey everyone, Mario again, coming at you another movie review, and today I'm reviewing a film that I've actually been meaning to watch for a little over a year, ever since I first watched the first film, while talking on Skype with my friend Efri, you know, he told, he told me, we were talking one day, and we are like, yeah, hey, let's watch this film, so we watched this film, Escape from New York, and I had fun with it, and you know, not that long ago I got this in my collection, this is the special edition. And since I had the sequel in my VHS collection, I've been meaning to watch it, and no, I didn't watch the VHS in case anyone's wondering. I actually watched it via Netflix, because I was hanging out at my friend's house yesterday, and we were going through Netflix, I was like, oh, let's watch this film, we watched it. And I had fun with the film. Now I will say, the film, minus, you know, different characters and a different setting, it is kind of a retread of this film with a higher budget and therefore it's less gritty and more polished. But I have to say, it still is a pretty fun sequel. It's one of those sequels that falls into the category of while it's not a better sequel or an on-par sequel, it is still a very fun sequel and a decent sequel. You know, like when you compare the 1990 Ninja Turtles film to its sequel, I could probably name other ones, but it's like kind of like that. It, of course, is the John Carpenter-directed film starring once again Kurt Russell as Snake Plissken. It is Escape from L.A. Snake is back. Name's Plissken. You know all that. And I have to agree with what uh, Kevin Thomas of the L.A. Times actually says on the back of this. High octane action thriller. And that's kind of says it. It's not non-stop action, but the action scenes in it I think are pretty good. Now, uh, the film, had, it had been in development for over 10 years by the time it was made. A script was commissioned in 85, and it was uh, written by Coleman Luck. And Carpenter later described the, the script as too light and too campy, which I can kind of imagine how that film probably would have turned out, probably. Kind of like how it's, kind of like an, ex an Expendables 2 tone, maybe even campier than that. Which, for the character of Snake, that doesn't work. You'd have, that'd be like taking Rambo and putting him in a thing, or taking Rocky and putting him in a weird fight, and thinking we already got parody like that. Rocky, you can't fight the Martian on Mars. Why not, Polly? There's no air on Mars. Well, there'd be no air for him either. I gotta do what I gotta do. I gotta fight him. I'm gonna go fight the Nero over there. You talking to me? You talking to me? I'm gonna get you. I know, I know wrong voice, but <laughs> I think you get the point. Now, the project remained dormant following that until the 1994 earthquake and of course the LA riots which after that Carpenter and Kurt Russell got together along with their longtime collaborator Deborah Hill and Carpenter says it was Russell's persistence that allowed this film to be made because Snake Plissken was a character that he loved and wanted to play again and I, I don't know when it was but at one point I know Russell stated that this out of all the characters he's played Snake Plissken is his favorite character that he's played which I can see why it's a very interesting character I mean, you're basically playing a badass, and I will say, if they ever did the Dark Tower series in an animated version, I could see Russell doing the voice. I mean, if they wanted to go with an older Roland, like I would love to see Russell do it, or even as Roland's father. But that's just probably me. That's just one of the characters I put on the list. Now, uh, the film was made for fifty million, which, when you compare the two films, even though you got to adjust for inflation. This film was made for six million in early '80s money. This was made for 50 million in mid '90s money. Even when you adjust for inflation, a lot more money equals a lot more polish. But the sad part is, it barely made half of that. I mean, it barely made 25 and a half million, which is a shame. I think this film should have at least broken even. Because of that, I doubt we'll ever get a third film, though, with how this film ends. If there ever was a third film, as Carpenter, I think, or Russell put it, it'd be Escape from Earth, which, that would be an interesting film, you know. See Snake Plissken out in space, beating up aliens. Like, what do I do? The name's Plissken. <laughs> you know, yeah, Snake versus Xenomorphs. You know you'd love to see that. <laughs> uh, even as a robot, that would probably work better as a robot chicken sketch, but it's like, and why is he doing this? Because the Xenomorph stole his fucking cigarettes. It's like Xenomorph with a cigarette, right? Yeah. That's mine, sucker. There's a... Now, anyway, the plot of the film. 
The plot is is that in the early millenni millennium, an earthquake struck L.A., causing the San Fernando Valley to flood and turning a portion of California into an island that stretches from Malibu to Anaheim. It's a personal thing I can say. Ha, 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 I'm not on the island. Ha, ha, ha. I live south of Anaheim, so I'd be outside the island. <laughs> then again, the bad thing is I'd be in a theocracy, so I probably would end up on the island. Either that or I'd flee south to Mexico. Yeah, I don't like theocracies. In case you're wondering what theocracy is, it's a government where religion basically is the law. Now, at the time that all this is happening, an American presidential candidate, played by Cri Cliff Robertson, who's an outspoken Christian theocracy, theocrat, excuse me, he's been saying, L.A. is a city of sin, it is a city of violence, like the mighty hand of God, waters will rise up and separate the sinful, sinful city from our country. Or how everybody talks. Now, of course, he's eventually elected president, and after all this, he has an amendment passed that allows his term to become permanent. And, of course, as this was going on in the movie, a Star Wars line was coming to mind. So this is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. Because that's basically what it is. That line fits this. Now, of course, his new policies include switching where the capital is, and then saying anyone who does not conform to moral America, which the laws he creates include banning things such as tobacco, which, you know, Snake's not going to like that, alcohol, red meat, firearms, profanity, non-Christian religions, atheism, and non-marital sex will be deported to L.A. Just makes you wonder how John Spartan would, would do, like Spartan and Snake teaming up to kill, to, to beat the crap out of this guy. That'd be, that'd be a fun robot chicken sketch right there. But, anyway, they can either choose to be deported they can repent, or they can die by electric chair. And of course, like with New York, a containment wall is built around the city. Now, in 2013, same year I'm recording this review, Corvo Jones, played by George Corifus, who is a revolutionary on the island of L.A., he seduces the president's daughter, named Utopia, which, I actually brought this up real quick with, uh, one of the friends I was watching this was because I was watching with two friends. And I said to one of them, who would name their daughter Utopia? And of course, this was his, this is what he said without dropping a dime. A black family would. Now, before anyone rises, my friend James, he's half black. So that's probably why he where the joke is coming from. I don't know, but that's, he just said it very quickly. So, I don't know. Just something I wanted to make note, but... Of course, the daughter's name is Utopia. The, you think about it, all well, the president and religious, so it's probably that's why. But outside of someone who's very religious, who would name their daughter Utopia? It's just a weird name. <laughs> then again, it kind of fits the character, I guess, a little bit. Because uh, she's apparently been brainwashed by Cue Cuervo Jones. And she manages to steal one of her father's remote controls, which controls something called the Sword of... I'm going to part trouble with the Sword. Democles, which is a super weapon. It's a satellite capable of destroying electronics anywhere on the planet, which would take the world back to the Dark Ages. Now, the president uses this to destroy, is want, wants to use this to destroy America's enemies, but I think you can guess Cuervo Jones has some plans with it. Now, uh, Utopia hijacks it aboard Air Force Three and crash lands via an escape pod. And now, of course, since she's now in L.A., they have to send in a rescue team. They're annihilated. So one of the president's top men decides, you know, we'll send someone in. They just happened to catch Snake Plissken again. So they decided to send him there since he was already scheduled to be exiled to the island anyway. And they basically make the same deal with him that they made in this one. You know, they put a, a virus in him and saying, unless you uh, do what we want, you're going to die. So he, Snake decides to go get the briefcase, and they also tell him to kill the president's daughter, which you could tell Snake, he doesn't have qualms with killing people when he has to, but you could tell if he's ordered to kill someone that, you know, you could just as soon as you could bring back, he's probably not going to do it, which is kind of a little bit of character development for him later in the film. But, you know, he goes through the city, meeting a bunch of strange characters, like Map to the Stars, Eddie, played by Steve Buscemi, which, perfect casting for this type of character. And he meets a bunch of people that steal body parts from other people, which the Surgeon General of L.A. was played by, uh, or was 
Bruce Beverly Hills, excuse me, was played by Bruce Campbell, which there's actually a picture of his scene on the back of the VHS. It's, you can tell even with even with the makeup, you can tell it's Bruce Campbell because they just modify his face a little bit. You're like, yeah, it's Bruce Campbell, hail to the king, baby. And what happens with him was kind of funny. And other people like the transsexual gang leader Hershey, who uh, Snake does know. And then, of course, a bunch of other random people. And, of course, Snake in a trench coat. You can't go wrong with that. Of course, he loses it. Then later on in the movie, I'm taking this back. That was kind of funny. And, of course, you can guess he eventually gets off the island, which I'm not going to spoil plot-wise. But the thing that happens at the very end of the movie, it really isn't Snake's character what, that he would do this because he's been pushed to this. And he sees that this president is full of you-know-what. And, you know, it's probably better for the world that this happens to the world than what the president plans. And in, in that line that he ends the movie with, welcome to the human race. Epic way to end the movie. And of course, one of the things at the end of the movie when I was watching it is like, it made me think of a modified version of a uh, Total Recall line. You think this is the real snake? It isn't. <laughs> and then that thing, you know, <laughs> oh, of course, snake wouldn't do that. He'd just look at him like he did in the movie. But... Now, how the film, how the scenes are all shot, they're shot very well. Like, the action scenes that are in this film, like I mentioned before, they're more polished here than they are here. But the grittiness in the, that arises from the $6 million budget in this film helps the film, especially the setting of New York. Now, this film, they could have made it seem a little grittier, but I don't know, for some reason, I don't mind the polish here. Maybe, I don't know. Like, maybe it could have used from being a little bit more gritty, but I don't mind it. Now, if there's any major problem I have with the film, probably maybe the sequel wasn't neat. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the sequel wasn't needed in the first place, but it's a fun film to watch. Uh, there is CGI in the film that is noticeable, but it's not really a major problem, I would say, because I can deal with it, and it's like it's the movie was made in 95 and released in 96, so early days of CGI like that used for stuff like that, but I think it works because most of it's like underwater sequences and just like quick transformation sequences like the helicopter that the blades can go inside the body and then other stuff. But other than that, it's practical effects like the explosions during the uh, parade chase sequence. The only other major CGI thing was the tsunami and then the surf during the surf sequence, which that's an over-the-top sequence, but in a fun way. I mean, surfing through LA, chasing a car, drive by Steve Buscemi, you gotta love that. And then, you know, jumping on the wave and all that. Snake surfing, you gotta love that. And, um... Uh, I'm not sure what else there is to say about the film without giving plot stuff away. I mean, Carpenter, he filmed... The, he did a good job filming the film. It's You look at these two films, back to back, they're good. This is a good companion piece of this film. And it's interesting, so when you watch these two films... I haven't watched this film in a couple months, but I remember enough about it so I can compare it to this one fairly. You can see how Carpenter's direction style had changed a little bit. Not just with how much more money he has to play with, but his direction style. It's grown a little bit. Granted, I think he does better when he has a little less money to deal with for the budget, but he's still doing a good job here. Now, I haven't seen all of his films, like I haven't seen Dark Star, haven't seen Assault on Precinct 13, haven't seen Someone's Watching Me or that Elvis TV movie he did, haven't seen The Fog in a while, I just saw rewatched The Thing a couple months ago, Christine I haven't seen, Starman I haven't seen, Big Trouble in Little China I haven't seen, Prince of Darkness I haven't seen, They Live I haven't seen in a long time, Memoirs of an Invisible Man I haven't seen, his segment of Body Bags, In the Mouth of Madness I've only seen bits and pieces, Village of the Damned I haven't seen, Vampires I haven't seen, Ghosts of Mars I haven't seen, and I've heard negative things about the war, which is probably why I haven't watched it. I haven't seen most of his films then. It's kind of sad. I don't know, maybe I'll watch it more. more. Now, for the actors, Kurt Russell, uh, he's still on top of his game as Snake Plissken. I mean, Snake, I mean, as one of my friends would put it, it's Kurt fucking Russell. Steve Buscemi, like I mentioned, perfect casting for the character of Eddie, you know, kind of a you know, the car salesman type personality guy. Like, come on, come on, Steve Buscemi. Perfect casting. The moment I heard him speak, I'm like, yeah, Steve was perfect for there. Peter Fonda as, Pi Fonda as Pipeline. Not a good job. 
Cliff Robertson is the president. He did a good job. Um, scumbag, uh, theocracy type guy. And as I was watching him, maybe it's because of how the guy looks. I was watching him. And I couldn't put a finger on him. But then near the end of him, I'm like, Mitt Romney. That's what I thought near the end. I'm like, it's Mitt Romney. If Romney had this type of power, I wonder if he would do stuff like this. Maybe, maybe not. Valerie Golino as Taslima. No, is yeah, Taslima. I think that's isn't that the girl he meets in that one scene? Checking doesn't say it in the synopsis, so I'm guessing that's who it is. That's who it is. She did an interesting job. Uh, Stacy Keach is Commander Malo. Malo. We have Mal Malo. An interesting job as well as the character I think it is. Pam Greer is the character Hershey. She did an interesting job, especially since her character is supposed to be a transsexual. The name sounds familiar, but I'm gonna check see what else she's been in real quick. Uh, let's see, Big Bird Cage, Foxy Brown. Oh, she was in Jackie Brown. Hmm, maybe that's why the name sounds familiar. Is that right? Oh, she played the title character in Jackie Brown. Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. She was in Mars Attacks. Same year as this film. Uh, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Ghosts of Mars. The Adventures of Pluto Nash. Episode of Law and Order SVU. Oh, she was in The Man with the Iron Fist. Maybe that's why that. That's maybe that's the other reason that name is coming up because they don't have that on the mind. Bruce Campbell is the Surgeon General. What more can I say about that? Perfect casting for that type of character, even though he's not in the film that much. It's good to see him doing something. Miss Bruce Campbell. George's... Or is, it, or is that a weird spelling of the name Jorge? I can't tell. Because it usually isn't Jorge spelled with a J. George's Corafes. Miss Cuervo Jones. He did a good job for the character. How he's dressed kind of reminds me of one militant char militant to Hispanic guy. I don't remember the guy's name, but you guys you guys should know what I'm talking about. You know the guy they always have with his face shown. No, it's, no, it's not uh, Pancho Villa. It's the other guy. Um, looking to see what else he's been in. Um, nothing here that I recognize. Oh, he was in Not Without My Daughter? Huh, I did not know that. Wonder who he played in that. A bunch of TV work, theater work. I'm guessing it's mostly uh, Hispanic stuff he's been in. AJ Longer as Utopia. For what she has to do, she's there. I mean, I'd say the um, probably the female characters in the first film were more memorable. But for what she has to do, she's there. She didn't really find her annoying. But that's just me. What else she's been in? An episode of Baywatch. Um, these are guest starring roles. Beverly Hills 90210, The Wonder Years. In the heat of the night. Touched by an Angel. The Drew Carey Show. Movies. People Under the Stairs, a film I have yet to watch. She played Alice. Meet the Deedles. She played Lieutenant Jesse Ryan. The Killing Box. Also, she's gotten work. Doesn't look like she's getting a lot of stuff more recently. Looks like it's mostly TV stuff. Or, like, minor stuff, but she got work. Um, uh, Brecken Meyer as the surfer. I thought that was interesting to see him as the surfer. I didn't even reckon I know that was him, but I guess that's what it says here. Guess you could go perfect casting there. Like, Radical dude! Is that you, Snake? You know, stuff like that. Uh, the score done by John Carpenter and Shirley Walker fit the tone of the film. I mean, and they also had other stuff. Now, uh, what else to say about the film? Fun sequel, good companion piece to the first film. If you are a fan of Escape from New York, I do give the sequel my recommendation. Whether you're liking, like, whether you're into liking it or not, it's going to be your prerogative. But I like it. It does have a fan base. It has a 5.5 on IMDb. It has a lower rating on Rotten Tomatoes, a 40% with the audience and a 53 with the critics, and there's no consensus. So some people like it, but. Looks like it's not not as much as the first film. Like what, one of the first things they said was, it's a sequel didn't really need to be made, but it's there for a sequel. Uh, my rating for Escape from L.A. Um, four out of five stars. 